Uh, the first question I have, after reading that, and what we've talked about in here, can innovation alone make us better off as a society? Innovation. What were some examples in the reading concerning innovation, going back thousands of years even, and also across uh, geography, innovations take place? Is that enough? No. What else? I mean, <clears throat> I think I heard something about like you need opportunity, like along with innovation. Like if you come up with something, it's not going to mean anything unless you have like a way to actually implement it or something. Okay. So innovation, in this sense, where you think of it like an idea, you might have an idea, but how can it make other people better off? For ourselves as entrepreneurs. We have to put that idea into action, right? But what about now going to a bigger picture? Innovations, big ideas, um, have for society. How, say, the, the entrepreneur or the inventor wants to put it into action. What is it? What is required? How does that happen, or, or why does it not happen sometimes? A great innovation, just nobody really ever gets to benefit from it. How come? Well, like I, in the reading, they kind of like stated, made some statements like, um, like about the Chinese, how some government, some like governmental plans, you know, a lot of people that were innovative couldn't really put it to action. They had to go around other kind of channels to get their point across. So I, that's what I think government and things like that can hinder innovation and opportunity. Okay. So with, with just innovation, there's got to be a way to channel it and, and to transfer to other people, right? Um, I think earlier lecture we talked about exchange. How to bring that into the process of exchange so that other people can actually utilize this, right? So, can innovation alone make us better off? No, we know that it can't. Uh, we need entrepreneurship, right? Innovation is one thing, but entrepreneurship, the act of capitalizing on an opportunity with this innovation, for example, uh, that's got to take place as well, right? So. The next question would be, okay, from the perspective of this reading, how can we encourage productive entrepreneurship? How can we encourage productive entrepreneurship? And in the question, the word we is used, right? From the perspective of this article, it's talking about society, those that, that help um, create the foundation. It talks about the rules of the game, right? The rules of the game, you know, what are the rules of the game? Um, how can we encourage productive entrepreneurship? What types of um, laws, how, how does government help encourage productive versus unproductive entrepreneurship. Going back to the reading, what were some examples? I guess however you want to approach this first, what's the difference between productive and unproductive? What were some examples? And how can we try to make sure that productive happens more often than it does? Well unproductive was like stealing. <clears throat> okay. So in the um, things that are illegal, right? So what did it say about entrepreneurs? throughout space and time, the level of entrepreneurs. Like it stays the same. Like it's pretty much stable. There's always a certain amount of people that are kind of action oriented, they're going to solve problems for themselves or other people. Um, they're going to do it regardless of the laws that are in place, right? They're going to find a way to make something happen. The question is, are the things that they're going to be able to do going to be more productive for society or less productive for society, right? So, how can we, productive entrepreneurship, what are examples of productive entrepreneurship? It's just like creating value. Okay, something that adds value to society. There's an example, um, was it the, uh, the steam engine? Somewhere through that reading, it talks about the steam engine. 
how it actually existed thousands of years ago in the Roman Empire. But it was only used for a very uh, restrictive purpose, right? The typical person did not get to benefit from the steam engine, and probably until most of you read this article, nobody actually knew that it actually even did exist back then. So it's, even today, we don't think about the steam engine having existed thousands of years ago. Today, we, we associate that with, say, the Industrial Revolution, and we're much more aware of the benefit from that today. It, it spread throughout most of society, and most of us get the benefit from that type of innovation. Why not back then? What was the difference? The innovation was there. The entrepreneurship was different. Right? What was the difference? Wasn't it like the monarchs or the government like kept it from being used elsewhere? Okay, it was only the only available way to profit from it was to get the government to see the need to use it. And the government in that period of time didn't see any reason for anybody else to get the benefit from it. And there was no market potential to get it to other people, right? Whereas today, with Apple computers, for example, late 1970s, early 1980s, you didn't have to go to the government and say, I've got this innovation. This is something that we would like to try to get out to people and, and see if they see how it could help them in everyday life. You didn't have to do that. They, without that channel on their own, brought this to consumers, right? It took time, of course, for it to catch on, and then once it did, the momentum built and built, and then today, everybody knows what Apple Computers is, right? Okay. That productive entrepreneurship happened for what reason? What's the difference 1978 in the United States with Apple versus the early centuries of the Roman Empire with the steam engine? What was it? Well, couldn't you say that just there's a market for it? So you kind of just made the comment that with the steam engine that the government only profited from it, and they didn't see that there was like a market elsewhere for it. Okay. So you could say that technology, there was a market for it, that's why it was profitable. Okay, so the market, and to clarify your answer, there was no market for it during the Roman Empire. Is that to say that there wouldn't have been if they would have been able to take this to many different uh, groups and say, can you see a use for this? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that you made a comment that, that the government only profited from it because they thought that they okay. needed to profit from it. All right, all right. So during that period of time, the ability to really go out into the main streets and, and reach potential investors or whoever uh, was pretty limited, right? right? Okay, so that, that innovation reaching all of society depended on how government, one of the only investors that you could actually go to for furthering this, this innovation, they had to see what their use could be. And if they saw one use, and it wasn't even beyond their own doors, then it wasn't gonna get anywhere else, right? So things had to change over time. It was a slow process. Thousands of years later, the same innovation makes it to many, many, many other people and most of society is able to benefit from it. All right. So the next question, how do or how have the rules of the game differed from place to place and time to time? do or how have the rules of the game differed from place to place and time to time? Said the rules of the game. What is he talking about? Like policies. Okay, policies. 
when we say policies, what are we, what are some specific examples of policies? Tax structures. Tax structure. What else can it be? Would this have to do with also like, um, uh, like if it, whether a government allows like free markets or not, or if they, because like with the Romans, like they're, the government is controlling the market, like they're saying what can and cannot be a market or whatever. Okay. And then like now with the Apple, we have a free market, so anyone can create and put anything in a market they want to. Technology, yeah. particularly today, has the benefit of much less regulation than the typical industry. Any industry that's been around for hundreds of years, there's the potential that there's a lot more regulation tied to that industry, right? Technology is changing every day. Regulations have not saddled that type of industry to the extent that other industries have been, right? So certainly, new technologies, there are investors all over the world. There's just a lot, even just in Silicon Valley, that when they see that, they're looking for innovations. They're looking for it. Uh, this is separate from any uh, government type interest. This is simply people with a capital willing to invest, looking for a good opportunity, inventors, innovators, come with new ideas, get in front of these individuals, and Shark Tank's a good example on TV even, uh, and they present them, and if it's obvious to a few investors that this is a good idea, they might get some assistance backing this, some shareholders come all come together, right, and try to make it a go. That process uh, happens much more freely in this country today than during the Roman Empire. Right? That, that's a fact for sure. Now I'll take that same idea, so that's from time to time, what about from place to place? What about the difference between innovation in the United States versus other places in the world? And what are some of the reasons that it doesn't happen? And you've hit, you've hit on this, right? The free market, the market itself. Markets have to exist. Markets have to exist for innovation to succeed and thrive and actually reach people, right? Markets, in our next part of this discussion, we'll talk more about markets themselves, or what are markets. And so one thing we can say, and the, the ability of individuals from all different uh, parts of society, we never know where a great innovation is going to come from, and we don't know who might see the benefit of that inno innovation, whether it's investors or even consumers, we just really have no idea. So the chance that a random group of individuals can really make a go of something and prove that it works to some group of individuals as a test, and then other individuals see that and it starts to catch on, we never know where that's going to happen, when it's going to happen, what it's going to be, who's going to be involved. There is absolutely Facebook today, and even Apple, even Microsoft, they're all started by young people with absolutely no name recognition in anything. It wasn't even a subsidiary of a major technology company, right? Facebook was not a subsidiary of, of Yahoo. Um, Apple was not a subsidiary of Hewlett Packard. Microsoft was not a subsidiary of Hewlett Packard or IBM, right? These people were just random individuals, and in their cases, they're all very young individuals, right? All in college or college age at the time that they came up with these ideas, right? So. To, to suggest that um, we could kind of predict where these innovations were going to come from, it'd be a useless exercise, right? We just have no idea. And even with, particularly with Facebook, to even imagine that such a thing um, would even be used by so many people as it is today, where you really don't even, it's hard for people to describe how does Facebook make its money? I've asked that in classes before. And a lot of people don't know how Facebook makes its money, right? It turns out they, they sell the data there, and that's an extremely uh, attractive product for companies that, that want to know buyer behavior, right? And Facebook is a, a mountain of data on buyer behavior, right? And so they can utilize that and figure out how to better market their own products, right? Either on Facebook or not even on Facebook. Okay. All right. Any questions on, so this, this is really the essence of model of the article, entrepreneurship, productive, unproductive, and destructive. And the idea is we would like to be able to set up our institutions, which are parts of the rules of the game, 
our tax structures, our regulations, uh, the ability of the, of the market to, to function more freely versus less, so that when these innovations occur, they can find the channels to, to bring them to more of us, because that's the only way we can actually benefit from it, right, as a society. So entrepreneurs wanting to make a go of things would be more likely to be successful in a system of, of rules, institutions that promote this more free exchange of ideas and for consumers to be able to freely uh, try out new products and services and then we will have more of these innovations actually become successful and potentially benefit us all. And that is the source of, of increasing productivity and raising standards of living for all of us, right? And certainly the role of the innovator, the role of the entrepreneur, the need of the consumer to be able to uh, use these things, purchase them, inventors to help move them forward, right? So the next thing we want to focus on today, we're going to have a new reading. And this, uh, this reading is one of your books uh, called The Science of Success. The first two chapters is what this is going to focus on. And this book talks about a concept called market-based management. And I just call it MBM, but there's five dimensions of market-based management that we're going to focus on today. And before we do that, though, we want to understand this term market. What is a market? What is the market in both contexts? So this is from the reading The Science of Success, which is code 2008. The idea is market-based management. So what we're going to do briefly is go away from the societal level and bring it back down to the level of a company trying to bring innovations to the marketplace, entrepreneurial individuals assisting in various ways, and we'll call this market-based management. So this is the part, this lecture today is going to focus more on your role as an entrepreneurial person in a corporation or starting your own company, market-based management is a, a general uh, approach to management that borrows ideas from markets. Okay? And what markets, what do we mean when we actually say that? So market-based management, the emphasis is on the market. Okay? What is a market? When you see the word market, what do you think of? Shopping, okay. You see the word market? You think of shopping. What takes place with shopping? What's going on? Exchange. Okay. Exchange is taking place. All right. So there, there's two sides to this. Are both sides benefiting in an exchange of this nature? If somebody's got something for sale, somebody has money, if we assume the case of today in the United States, that they're willing to give up for that thing. And we're going to assume that both are made better, better off. This is a voluntary exchange, is what we're going to assume, right? Nobody's forcing anybody to make this exchange. You've chosen to offer products because these are what you know and are interested in, and someone else has chosen to purchase them because for some reason they either want them or feel they need them or whatever it might be, right? Um, a market, your example is shopping, okay? Um, if I said the market, the market. What does that imply? To me, I think of like the group of all the sellers, like the group of all the people together who are trying to offer the same kind of product. Okay. So we have the market for a particular thing, right? The market for uh, for computers. The market for plasma TVs. The market for vacations. Myrtle Beach competes in the market for people vacationing, particularly in warm weather, right? Um, each of those actually are very large markets, right? Myrtle Beach is competing <coughs> with, with uh, destinations that offer this all over the, the country, right? At least. 
So in that market, there are there are of course individuals on the supply side, and then there are consumers on the demand side, right? Now, what is it about? Um, so if I say in general the market, say when I say market, I want you to think supply and demand. This is a very general economic approach to markets and understanding markets. We're going to take basic principles of economics and we're going to apply them to markets. All right? And we're going to say supply and demand. This, this is the basic components of any market. All right? Now, in order to, to better see how this, this fits in, we have to come up with some, some ideas. Okay? So there are five dimensions of market-based management. is vision. The second is virtue and talent. Before I go further, with the, the remaining three, let's start to focus on the first one, vision. All right. So market-based management is an approach to running an organization. All right. In entrepreneurship, we're concerned with A, either starting an organization, or B, taking an existing organization and at least going into a new direction with a part of that organization, whether it's a new product or service, or uh, maybe changing the way the organization kind of approaches the market that it's in. Maybe the market's changing, right? So market-based management is taking, there's two ways to look at this. We're gonna to focus today on the idea of just basic economics, supply and demand. Then I'll let you read the first two chapters of this. We'll come back next week and we'll talk about a whole other uh, way of looking at markets that market-based management borrows from in economics, which is actually more from the political economy side of economics with institutions. Some of the stuff that Baumel talks about more so. We're going to go away from that today, and I'm going to focus on just general economics as to the, uh, the way that it influences market-based management. Okay? So vision, you start a new company, suppose you're going to write a business plan for a brand new company, right? And it says, well, what's your mission statement, right? Or, or what's your vision for this company? What are you trying to do? Um, so, so a vision. From an economic perspective, the vision is going to have to really be specific in terms of what how your company or this new product or service fits into the market. And the market's a general question. It's going to be specific though, right? Specific a market. It's got to be whatever niche. You know, I think last week or the week before, we had an example here uh, from one of you about starting a new company that would sell paralegal services to law firms, right? That's a very specific market. The vision has to be tied specifically to that, right? To the actual service and the market that it performs in. Now, in terms of the economy overall, the vision, to make it as specific as possible so that it works for this particular market, what must be the case about the vision? I mean, who, who's got to come up with the vision? Who, who actually, can, can somebody just say, give you a vision? Can somebody provide a vision for you? Say, oh, you're doing this? Well, here's your vision. 
Would you buy into that? If, if you, you're the entrepreneur, you come up with this idea, and you go to someone and say, this is what I've got, and they say, okay, here's the vision. Here's the vision for that. What would, how would that make you feel? You didn't create it. Now, you didn't create it. Right? All of a sudden, the thing you created, you had in mind a vision, right? You had a vision for this thing. So, more than likely, you're going to come up with this vision. You're going to put it down on paper. But you're going to talk to other people. You're going to get some feedback. And more than likely, the more people that kind of have some buy into this vision, the more beneficial it's going to be for you, right? And probably the more effective it's going to be. And maybe think of some things that you maybe didn't think of, right? In terms of the market overall, in terms of how other things might affect the market for this, right? So your vision, how would you go about creating a vision for your new product or service? What do you think you would actually do? You to, this vision that you're gonna, you're actually gonna put it on paper, anybody you employ, investors, customers, you're gonna share this vision with them. How are you gonna come up with it? You probably ask yourself questions. Okay. You'd like ask questions like if you have an idea for a product, but then you'd be like, well, what would it be like? What would it be made out of? Or how expensive would it be? Who would it target? How would I sell it? Stuff like that. Okay. So it's going to be informed by, well, certainly the market, right? All of those things you just named are different aspects of the market, right? The vision has to be informed by the market. And this market is other producers. Potential consumers, investors, employees, right? And they all, all of them are players in some way in this broad market, but more specifically the direct market that you're actually I don't want to participate in. So your vision will have to be specific and informed by the market. Virtue and talents. So after you've got this vision and you start building use the example of a new product or service. You start building this business to start to take this out to the market and you start bringing in other individuals, whether they're investors or employees. Right? You want people that have certain characteristics or virtues that are consistent with what you're trying to achieve, are consistent with the vision, right? And that buy into this vision, right? Uh, talents, they complement that. They can help you achieve, right? So you have you have certain virtues, you want people of a certain uh, ethical characteristic or, or bone, and also people that are talented. If you want both, right, you don't want somebody who is the most talented person imaginable for helping you get this thing off the ground, but maybe they have the, the worst character you could describe. They would have no qualms whatsoever about doing completely unethical things, maybe even illegal things, right? hiding things from you, uh, as far as they're concerned, as long as they're making money, it doesn't matter. You don't want those types of individuals, right, to create real problems for your organization. So you have to find, you want to look at both, right, virtue and talents, right? And in the reading, I'm not going to list them all, but an example of these, uh, there are 10, if you go into the reading, uh, the first one is integrity. You certainly want people of integrity. And from this perspective, first and foremost, you want people of integrity, right? Regardless of their talent, you want people of integrity. You want people that are going to comply with whatever regulations there might be in this market that you're going to interact in, uh, with the laws that you're going to uh, have to abide. 
You want people that are going to be focused on value creation for you and the company. You want people that are entrepreneurial. In this, in market-based management, the idea is called principled entrepreneurship. And these are, I'll, I'll send these to you in a, in a document. Uh, the principled entrepreneurship, this is all under virtue and talent. We've got one, two, down to 10, all right? You want people who are focused on the customer. That'd be the fifth one. Knowledge is gonna be an important aspect of virtue and talents. Accepting of change, knowing that sometimes we might have to adapt our approach in a given aspect of this product or service, or the market itself might change. Outside forces might affect things, laws might change, any of these things can happen. So we've got to be able to adapt to change. Um, we have to uh, be humble. We have to, we want people who are willing to accept that maybe somebody has a better idea than we thought of and that that doesn't just ruin the whole entire thing, right? That people can, can respect that and are willing to accept it, right? We want people that certainly respect other people's opinions or thoughts, right? We want that. And the idea that we get fulfillment from creating this value, right? That people, there's a buy-in to this. People, people um, are willing to put effort, time, energy into this because it's going to be fulfilling for them, all right? So that's virtue and talents. And we're going to spend more time on this as we go on throughout the, the semester. And it turns out it's going to be one of the most important aspects of building an organization. The right people. The right people. Uh, take, for example, if you started a, uh, um, let's say, a, a restaurant. What do we know about this is an area that is heavy in the restaurant industry, okay? Um, well, it's probably something, what would you associate to any of you work in the restaurant industry, okay? What's, uh, what's something about, is change an aspect of working in the restaurant industry as far as employees are concerned? And what, what do I mean by that? If you were a manager, what would you have to deal with in terms of your employees? As far as change is concerned, your order. Like different personalities? Okay, different personalities, for sure. <coughs> this year to next year, what's likely to be the case? High turnover. High turnover, okay. You've got high turnover in that industry relative to a typical industry, right? So high turnover, how are you going to deal with that as a manager? That's going to present some challenges itself, right? You're always going to be looking for, for talent, character, right? But you're going to be, these people are going to be churning out all the time, right? So it's going to be finding employees, good employees, is going to be a constant battle in that type of business, right? All right, let's move on down to the third dimension. We're going to call this knowledge processes. Processes is an idea that's also, uh, as we read the other uh, reading, Awakening the Entrepreneur Within, they call it systems. Or he calls it systems. Processes, systems, whichever. It's just the notion that there are some, um, some approaches that will make things a little more efficient to accomplish, right? Um, knowledge processes are those, any, any activities that take place within the organization, for example, hiring. Uh, what would be a knowledge process that would be associated with hiring? Let's go away from uh, the restaurant industry and let's go to, say, hiring um, professionals that are going to be tasked with uh, some substantial freedom. Uh, let's say a sales professional. Professional that's going to uh, have 
the responsibility of, of helping you try to spread this product or service in a significant part of your market that you're trying to reach, some geography, okay? And say that geography is even far from, from your headquarter area. Uh, you might be in the Midwest and you're trying to expand in the Southeast. How would you go about hiring an individual for that purpose, this new company? What kind of process would you in place to try, try to help ensure that you hire the right person the first time? I mean, this person can go out there pretty independently and be trusted with doing the, the work that needs to take place in order to help build your business in this region. And it's not going to be constant. You can't check on the person all the time. This person's independent out there. <coughs> Could you set up a process that would help you just with interviewing people? And, and what might that process look like? You know, how would you set something up like that? What are some things that you could do? If you were tasked with this, what do you think you would do? When you brought in people, what would you, could you set up some rules, some standards that would help you do this? What might you do? I mean, like, couldn't you obviously, like, have the resumes and do interviews? Couldn't you even, like, base your decision off, like, referrals okay. from other people? All right, so resumes, interviews, referrals, you can start to build a system that is based on the experience of others, maybe in other industries, completely unrelated, but, but as far as people are concerned, maybe these are just some proven methods, right? You take in a certain number of resumes. You do, maybe you check the referrals first before you even bring individuals in. Depends how you're doing. You do a series of interviews, right? But let's say you get 100 resumes for this one job. Do you bring in 100 people? No. So you're going to have to have some sort of some guidelines that will start to kind of eliminate candidates, but really start to focus in on the top potential candidates, right? So that you can efficiently do this process. And you might have a, we call it a recipe, you know, a set of guidelines that says whenever you're going to bring in and you're going to make a new hire in sales, for example, let's use this certain approach. This approach has been tried other places. It works. We can all understand it and kind of buy into it. So you might have a knowledge process as far as bringing in new professional sales employees is concerned, right? And you might have a documented process. You're going to follow this process every time. And hopefully you start at the top and then it funnels down. And what comes out at the bottom is your best candidate that meets a lot of what you require for this position, right? And if you do it like that, hopefully you won't have to do that process over and over and over again. Hopefully you don't bring that candidate in, send them to the southeast, and after four months they say, this isn't for me, right? I'm leaving. Something, hopefully that doesn't happen often with the process. When you go back and check the process, see what, what did we miss in the process? How do we not see that there is a potential for this person to leave within four months? And now we have to start the whole process over, right? Um, so you should have a process about this here knowledge that we talked about um, at least a couple of weeks ago. There is, there is knowledge that applies to, in many different ways, right? So in this case, we're talking about specific knowledge about a specific function that we need in the company to accomplish things, right? And as much as we can, we're going to try to have a, a plan for this, right, within this organization. Okay, so that's knowledge processes. And there can be many different ones. All right, the fourth dimension is decision rights. Decision rights kind of come from this idea. Different people within the organization are going to have to be uh, enabled or given the capability to make certain decisions without going to management or upper management or individuals every time something happens in the course of doing business, right? 
So certain individuals would have certain decision rights. Others might have more decision rights. Others might have less decision rights, right? How do we, first by function, simply by function, a specific job in the company is going to entitle somebody to more decision rights than another, right? But in the company, how do we determine who is going to, over time, go into some of these different positions? A position of more decision rights as opposed to less. We have to have some way of maybe quantifying that a certain individual is capable of doing more with less oversight. We can trust that, right? We can trust the outcome. We can trust the process the individual uses to get the results, right? Uh, that we would all support the approach that they've taken, at least after a little bit of discussion. Some individuals might be very innovative and maybe take a slightly different approach that might surprise some of management. But then after a discussion, hey, that, we never thought of that. That works. Uh, it fits you know, our definition of, of character. Uh, we don't see any challenge to this that would uh, hurt us in the long run, right? So this is great. Well, how would we identify these types of individuals within the company and help them move up through the organization? What, um, what methods would you have? And what did you put in place to kind of try to ensure that those individuals that are more capable of doing things, it, it's, it's recognized and that they don't get lost in the organization, particularly in a large organization, right? But even in a small organization, what might you start to recognize? How would you, how would you see this? How would you, let's, let's say we're starting a small company. And in the beginning, we just have some task doers, right? Some, some individuals without any management responsibility, they're just they're doing the task in-house. Then we see we're going to have to expand. What would you look for? How would you know who, maybe, of the people that you already have might be the right individual to move forward into a new role that has more, uh, more capability flexibility to make decisions without always checking with you as an owner. How would you recognize this in this new company? I mean, you look for like those virtue aspects in number two. Okay, and how would these begin to show up? <clears throat> like closely monitoring your employees, I guess, and watching how they interact and what they do and making decisions Okay, so in your words, closely monitoring your employees, see how they interact with other employees, see how they deal with decisions that they do have to, to take, right? Um, and now closely monitoring, do we mean standing beside them all the time, or do we mean from a distance, but paying attention to what's going on? Just paying attention and you know, knowing what's going on in your own company, I guess. Right, okay, so you, you cannot be distance from what's going on in your company, right? You have to, you can't be a, an owner that just assigns everything to the rest of the people, particularly if they're all really just task-oriented employees. You need to be there, right? You've definitely got to be there and learn about your people and start to learn which of your people have different capabilities than others and which ones might be willing and, and truly able capable uh, to start to take on some of these other roles. The only way you would know that is if you stayed kind of in close association with them and, and got some feedback and also what what would give you an idea that they might be able to do something different than what they're doing now but on a regular basis. Give them tasks. Give them some things that once you start to see this maybe maybe it kind of comes quickly and maybe the first thing you notice is for the thing they're doing they do it really well. Then you start to notice these other things. Say they seem to be thinkers, right? They seem to uh, always have ideas, but they don't just focus on those ideas. They, they, they continue to focus on the tasks that they have to do. They get that done, but they have these other things that they're always thinking about too. Um, could you maybe give them a test task, right? a new task? Like, hey, we're thinking about this, and I'd like you to try this out, right? And so you start to kind of give a little bit more responsibility 
for the individual and see what happens, see how they respond to it. And in your mind, or maybe even on paper, you document it, right? And you, you know, that's a, that's one for them right there, right? And so now, as this, this entity starts to grow, you start to build um, kind of a database, if you will, of people that have taken on some other things that you've given them and they responded well. And then, you know, it might be six months, it might be a year, it might be two years, whatever, when, when the organization is ready to move forward and it's looking for a pool of people inside, start to look at these individuals and see how they respond to things, see maybe with greater likelihood, this individual will perform the way that we need to in this task, right? And then you move that individual over into that task. Before you do that, the last dimension is incentives. And incentives is probably one of the purest economic principles that, that this is all borrowing from, right? There has to be incentives so that individuals, employees, that you would bring into this organization to help you accomplish your goal, to bring your innovation to the uh, market. If the incentives aren't there, think of the individuals in the organization that are the task doers. Even though they might be more capable, if the incentives aren't there, if they know you don't really pay attention to what goes on in the company, you've never asked my opinion or his opinion or her opinion on anything, really. All you ever do is come in and ask if we've done what we're supposed to do, right? Period. And if we have, you leave. If we haven't, you yell, you get mad, right? And then you still leave, right? That's a clear signal to the employees you don't really care that much about them. You just want to make sure that they're doing the thing that they're doing, right? There's no signal that there's an incentive for you to do what you're supposed to do, plus maybe even more, right? And then if you do go a little beyond that, maybe you'll be rewarded by maybe being able to do something more than what you're doing, a little more responsibility. Maybe there's a greater reward in terms of pay, maybe a greater reward in terms of more flexibility, it could be different things, right? If there's no clear signal that those incentives are there, then what might even good employees do in that situation? Let's just look at that for a second. You got some good employees, but there is no signal that there's any potential to move into a role that you might be more challenged, more rewarded in the organization. What might employees do in that situation? Okay, they might even go somewhere else. Let's say you think you've got them captured there. It's a bad economy. Unemployment rate is high. They need this job. What might they do? Maybe give them a little bit of a pay raise. Now, I suppose you're not going to. You're just, you think that there's no reason to do anything else. They're stuck here, right? What might good employees do in that situation? Say, for all intents and purposes, they pretty much are. On average, they are stuck there. Okay, they might stop working as hard. They're, they're, they're good people. They're talented. But this job isn't the only thing that they have to devote their energy to, their, their mind, right? And they've got enough money for maybe what they need or so. Maybe moving forward would be something they would like to have happen but they don't see any option in this company. So they start to just kind of slack back a little bit, right? Maybe they continue to do that thing that they're supposed to do and do it well because they just feel a moral responsibility to do that, but they may not feel a moral responsibility to go above and beyond, right? Share any ideas. They could see things on a daily basis that could be done better. Maybe one of the processes, maybe one of the knowledge processes as far as the output on a daily basis has a flaw and it can be fixed real easily but you don't know that as the owner because you're not involved with the process but some of the employees know maybe even all of them but none of them really feel compelled to come to the table and say if you change this we could lower our cost substantially or out in the market if you go to this area 
we know that there is going to be uh, a lot of people willing to adopt this product or service, right? That just might not happen if there's never a clear signal that your ideas will be accepted, at least considered, uh, that you might be able to even be involved in the new, new process or whatever it might be. So you can, you can kind of stop things short by just not even having a system in place that would signal that we welcome this, right? And one of the uh, components of virtue and talents is principal entrepreneurship. So you could, you could acknowledge to your employees that we do value this, right? We value um, creative thinkers, individuals that, that are trying to solve problems, right? And that would be willing to kind of go above and beyond. And if they demonstrate that, we're willing to reward them for that. Right? And all, there's all different kinds of ways that that can be done, but at least it's, it's in there, right? It's part of your, part of your systems, right? Okay, so market-based management, it's this idea. If we, if we look at the economy overall, and we try to bring into the company some aspects of the economy, one thing that we want to have happen is, is first, for this organization, we have to have a set of processes, right? And in the economy, we have to have some rules of the game, right? That we're going to play in, that the economy is going to function in and function best. Within the company, we set up some rules of this game. Some of them are influenced by society on the outside, but some of them just within the company. We'll create these, right? We'll create these knowledge processes. We'll have some guidelines. We'll have an order in terms of how we produce things, on and on and on. But then we know that change is inevitable, right? And we need to be able to adapt to this. And we also know that any one individual cannot be the person that guaranteed would be the person to bring about a new approach or information that is useful in our process going forward that we currently haven't accounted for today. Right? So in, this, in society, we don't, we don't have any way of knowing who this might be, right? And in our organization, we've got a pretty good idea that it has to come from this select group of people, right? And so we need to set things up within the organization to where there is some flexibility, some freedom for people to uh, try, try to try new things within the company, suggest new things, and maybe their role would even change within this organization, right? There's got to be a place for that. Okay, so once uh, you guys have read this, we'll talk next week about how this kind of draws from, from a market economy, uh, a market economy uh, in a way that it will be uh, conducive to a growing organization that, uh, in, in the case where we don't really know where all the growth opportunities will come from, we have an idea, right? But we don't know uh, which employees are best for each new thing that we might take on or even existing things in the company, we've slotted them into a, a place in the beginning, but maybe after a year, this employee's figured out he or she would rather be doing this other thing, and this employee's figured out he or she would rather be doing that other thing. Maybe simply switching them causes your company to move forward a little bit more efficiently, a little bit better results, and all that did was take the people within the organization and move them around in a real simple way but if you don't have um, the willingness to do that, if, if you've got a rigid structure and you're not willing to take new information and move on it, then you're not going to be able to adapt to that new information and, and make good change, right? You're going to be, you're going to be forced to sort of stay in a state where any new information can have no effect on the company and it's just going to depending on how the market evolves outside, or the market that you're in, um, it could affect you in a negative way, more negative, less negative, depending on the circumstances. So you want to have an approach that, that makes your organization flexible, right? And, and can draw on as much information and knowledge that's out there in the different parts of the organization as possible. Okay, so that, in a very brief overview, is market-based management.
All right. Of the, of the readings from last week, we had um, one of the readings was on it, but I did not sign it, but it's a chapter from the book The Millionaire Next Door. You guys heard of The Millionaire Next Door or The Millionaire Mind? Two different books, all right. One of them was written in, I think, 1998, and what it did was it surveyed hundreds and hundreds of, of millionaires, and it came up with a system of how the group would consider and how it would determine if this individual was actually a millionaire, right? And the book was all about basically really the mindset and the habits of millionaires. Now, why are we focusing on millionaires in this class as entrepreneurship? It's not necessarily the case that each of you wants to be a millionaire by any means, right? But it is, of course, about entrepreneurship and maybe starting something, growing it. And we've already demonstrated that one of the rewards in our market economy is money, right? And so in terms of looking to those that have started something and made a success of it, millionaires are, are a pretty good cohort to, to kind of look to and see how they've actually done this in general, right? So there's a, in the, in the slides from last week, at the end, there were some basic characteristics, some statistics really, about millionaires at the time of, of that writing, which is 1998. Um, fortunately, a lot of it still applies today, uh, even though it's been almost 15 years since that writing. We're in an economic environment where income is relatively flat from that period of time. Fortunate for our purposes, unfortunate for us as a society, right? But uh, that's just the fact of, of the economy right now. So I'm going to reassign it for next week. You'll go and, and read it's just that one chapter from that book. Uh, it's pretty interesting in terms of what it, what it says about uh, typical millionaires back in this period of time. Again, still applies today. And we'll, we'll discuss it more next week. Uh, I'm going to assign chapters one and two from the science of success, which will go much more into market-based management. And you'll have a uh, you heard it from me, and you'll read about it more. And we'll go into it more next week. All right? I'm going to assign a discussion post that'll be due uh, this Thursday, and just look for an email from me, and I'll have the specific assignment from that. Any questions? on this or the assignments for the end of the week.